Well, if you have your Bibles, open up with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Title of my message this morning is Echad. Echad. Complex unity. I had a subtitle. It's not on the screen. The fusion of diverse elements into a harmonious whole. The fusion of diverse elements into a harmonious whole. As we're continuing in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, clearly we're not guzzling the content, right? We're slowing down and we're savoring the words, letting it sit in our mouths and taste uh, the words that the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And uh, we're going to be looking at these next verses in Ephesians chapter 4. And this morning in these next few verses, we're beginning what possibly amounts to another mini-series within this overarching series. As we, um, and so I think this morning will really serve as an introduction to our looking more closely at these next verses of Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. It's, it's foundational to what is being communicated here. As we open the fourth chapter of, F, of Ephesians, Paul is pleading with this very diverse congregation. It's a congregation made of those who, who grew up in strong Jewish homes and, and have stood in opposition to the pagan surroundings for all of their lives. They had, and it's, you've got those folks, and then you've got those who grew up in this pagan society who were immersed in all of the, the occultic witchcraft that, uh, that Ephesus had to offer. Whatever was there, it, whatever you wanted, uh, you know, you could find uh, in terms of the occult. And so here, these folks too had come to the Lord, and now they are together with these vastly different backgrounds, a a family, a congregation together. They had been, at one point, at hostility with one another, but now they are one in Messiah. The wall of hostility rooted in all the various differences that had divided them. Divided them. That wall had been obliterated and is being obliterated. So he pleads with them, you are Kedoshim. You are holy ones. You are saints. You have been made pure by Messiah Yeshua. Sons and daughters, chosen, adopted, favored. That's who you are. That's the worth that God has declared about you. So now walk your worth. Walk the way of the king. Walk the way of the kingdom. Learn the way of the king. Walk in true humility and attitude and heart. You know, I read something this week. It says, being humble doesn't mean thinking less of yourself. It means thinking of yourself less. I thought that was pretty cool. Walk with humility. Thank you, Charlie. Walk with meekness, power under control, strength and submission. And be, we last week talked about, be slow to anger, right? God is slow to flare his nostrils. Not just flow, slow to an outward explosion of anger, but that inward boiling of anger, slow to flaring his nostrils. But you, Paul says, be slow. Slow to flare your nostrils. He says, bearing with one another. You know, like if someone says to you, I'm bearing with you. Are you like, aw, that's so sweet. Really? I'm putting up with you. I'm tolerating you. Thank you for tolerating me. Bearing with one another. Believe it or not, sometimes I'm difficult to tolerate. Sometimes you are difficult to tolerate. So everybody say that. Sometimes I'm difficult to tolerate. Okay, and we'll just stop there. <laughs> Let's just focus there. And he says, bearing with one another, right? And then the whole aim of the message here pivots onto the next phrase in verse 3 that says, making every effort to keep the unity of the Ruach in the bond of peace. Unity. Keep the unity of the Ruach, of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What is unity? Well, unity is not uniformity. They're different. Uniformity means that we all are uniform. Right? We all, we're like a replica of one another. We're like wooden soldiers. All look the same. Cookie cutter style. In uniform. One form. Un uniform. One form. 
So unity is not uniformity, and unity is not singularity. In unity, in fact, in the, the very nature of the concept of unity requires multiplicity, doesn't it? You can't be in unity with yourself, right? You, no, you're not in unity with yourself. I, unity means there's more than one. When I, when, when, a, if, okay, if you're a football fan or if you understand anything about football, that the key to the offense is the offensive line. And that for the offensive line, for the offense to go and to make progress, if you're going to make progress on the field, those five guys have got to operate as one. They have got to operate in unity. They've got to have, and the whole offense in fact does, but they have to if they, if, they're not, if they don't know what the other is doing, they're going to bang into each other, fall down all over the place. No one's going to go anywhere because they're not in unity in the direction that they're going. A team requires unity. Unity is not merely the absence of division. Just because there's not conflict, just because there's not antagonism, within a congregation or within a family or within a business doesn't mean there's necessarily unity. It doesn't mean that, I mean, you may not be like battling and beating each other up on the one hand, but that doesn't mean that you are wor working together, walking as one on the other hand. There's an in-between there of just sort of existing, not, not going anywhere, but not killing each other in the process. Unity moves beyond merely existing without conflict and into functioning together in purpose. In fact, look, I know, I know that you're, if, if you're like me, trust me, you're like, good grief, how long are we going to be in Ephesians? Rabbi, can you get to the good stuff? Can you get to the, can you... Slow down. Slow down. Let's get to the spiritual warfare. Let's get to the stuff at the end, right? Let's go, right? Let's do this. Here's the deal. If we don't get down that we have to be in unity, walking the way of the king with the values of the king, in unity for what purpose? We don't defeat the enemy with the weapons of the enemy. And those weapons often, the weapons of this world, the, what is the nature of the weapons and the fighting in this world, of the, of the spirit of this world, is anger and rage and hostility and domination and take you my way. We've got to get down the way of the king. Together, keep getting down. <laughs> We're not going to get it down, but we've got to be getting that down together in purpose, in func functioning together. If we are going to go into the darkness by the power of the Holy Spirit, we must be in unity. And we're all so stinking different. We're all, and some of us are so much alike, that's where we bang up against each other too, right? Like, just my spot. <laughs> unity means moving together as one in purpose. And in unity, what the Lord himself has declared that we can do anything, accomplish anything when we walk as one. Now, he declared this in, an, in a negative way, actually. In Genesis chapter 11, you'll recall, the Tower of Babel. Remember that great story? The people were operating in unity. They were operating in, as one, as it were, in order to make a name for themselves. They were operating as one, not to exalt the name of God, but to make a name for themselves. 
They were unified in language. They had one language, echad, one, the same language. It says, Adonai said, look, the people are one, echad, and all of them have the same language, echad. So this is what they've begun to do. Now nothing they plan to do will be impossible. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other's language. In unity, when humans are operating in unity, echad, the Lord says nothing they plan to do will be impossible. In this case, their echad was to make a name for themselves instead of the, focusing on the name of the Lord. Operating in a proud rebellion against God, in an independence of God, I don't need you, we'll make a name for ourselves. We don't need you to make a name for us. So a, he, the Lord, you'll notice in Genesis chapter 12, when he comes to Abraham, he says, I will make you, for you a great name. God will make Abraham a great name. But when we say, I'm going to make a name for myself, that's when the Lord says, no, 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 wrong. He says, nope, for their own sake, I will intervene. And God comes and brings confusion. Now, I've often heard people say, well, God's not the author of confusion. Well, in Genesis 11, when our unity is a unity against the purposes of God, then for our sake, and ultimately, for his own name's sake, God intervenes. And if necessary, authors some confusion. The Bible, but, but Rabbi, doesn't the Bible say God is not the author of confusion? Well, in 1 Corinthians 14, 33, Paul is giving instructions to the assembly about order in their service in regard to the gifts of tongues and prophecy and so forth, interpretation of tongues. And he says the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. You're not in some sort of trance. You're not out of control, he says. You're not when you're bringing forth the word of the Lord. And then he says, for God is not a God of, and I didn't put this word up here, but the word in Greek is akatastias, but of peace. What is akatastias is not confusion. It's rebellion. It's revolt. It's uprising. God is not a God that is okay with uprising and rebellion and revolt and asserting your own way. That's what he's not okay with. And so within the congregation in 1 Corinthians 14, and someone says, I'm going to make my way, and I'm going to, you know, he says, hey, let's have order, and God is not a God of this uprising. It's the same word that's used in Acts 5.36 where Rabbi Gamaliel is, is trying to tell everyone, just relax, and he points to an uprising uh, that, was, that had happened, uh, the uprising of Thutis, and he uses this particular word. God is not a God that's okay with rebellion and uprising. He's dealt with it, Right? In heaven, he's dealt with it. And what he does is he, when, when Satan rebelled against him and, and rose up against him, he said, mm, you're out. And when Adam and Eve rose up against God to say, we'll take the fruit, we'll do it, and didn't submit to God's way, the garden, we were sent out of the garden. When there are those who come in unity to rise up against God, he will indeed scatter them in confusion. That is an act of mercy. He will scatter them in order to give them an opportunity to turn to him. I mean, you have passages in, in the New Covenant scriptures where in 1 Corinthians 5 where the Lord actually says about someone who's walking in open rebellion against God, overt rebellion within the congregation and saying, hey, I'm, and, and, and uh, like, saying, I'm fine, he says, expel him, hand him over to the adversary so that the purpose is that ultimately by, he will experience the depths of his lostness and therefore return to God. The purpose of God is redemption. But in, so in unity, God will not uh, tolerate unity against him. So back to unity, though. In Hebrew, the root word for unity is Echad or Yachad. Um, Yachad, we used to, our name used to be Beth Yachad. Beit Yachad um, is a word we know, know well. Echad is a word we know well. It's the word for one, to operate as one. Shema Israel. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Echad. And we're going to come back to that in just a moment here. But I want you to follow what Paul is doing here in Ephesians 4. He says, making every effort to keep the unity, the oneness of the Ruach in the bond of Shalom. 
And then he continues with this line of thinking, making every effort to keep this oneness. For there is one body, one Ruach, just as you also were called with one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one immersion, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. One body, one Ruach, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one immersion, one God. Paul begins to define here foundational points of our unity. And we're going to, that's why over the next couple of weeks at least, we're going to go and we're going to look at more closely at these foundational points. I don't think this is going to be a seven-part mini-series, but maybe at, at least two, but maybe three. I expect on some weeks we're going to cover two or three of these. But as we study these foundation points more carefully, and, and, and you'll see this as we get there, you'll find that each of these one this, one that, each of them contains an element of diversity, a unity in each of them. For example, one Ruach, one spirit. But in 1 Corinthians 14, it says there is one Ruach, one spirit, but many gifts. And he distributes them as he sees fit. So you have the one Ruach, but there's a diversity in the expression of the way the Ruach operates. But one Ruach, it still comes back to the one. To the one. As we look at this oneness, the unity to which we are called, it's God's not calling us to uniformity. And that, I, I love that. I love that. I lo when I was in, in Bible college, you know, I grew up, and I, different influences in my life um, some real, I mean, some of the most influential pastors in my life, fire breathers, men of God, love the Lord, and their, and their whole way was different than mine. It just wasn't me. And I remember when I went, went to, to school, I was like, I, I wanted to, I took classes on preparation of sermons and studying for sermons, but I it wasn't required, so I didn't take it. I wouldn't take the one that talked about how to deliver a message. I didn't want to just be in somebody else's cookie cutter mold. I was like, Lord, you called me. Now you teach me this. I want to learn your word and how to communi communicate your word. But I don't want someone telling me that you lower your voice here so they all get closer. I, I, don't, want, I don't want that. I just want to be, I want, I want, to, I want my sling and a stone. I don't want to wear Saul's armor. And, and you get to be who God made you. And you don't have to walk around saying, well, I'm, I'm just not so-and-so. I'm not. Stop it. Stop that. You weren't made to be so-and-so. If you were so-and-so, you wouldn't be you. And there'd be a piece of the puzzle that was missing. Don't try to fill someone else's spot in the puzzle. Fill the spot God made for you. Be who God's called you to be understand who that is. Keep seeking. So he's called us to this unity, but it's not uniformity. And so as we look at this unity, the, we're going to see the multifaceted aspects of these foundation points. And the first one we see, of course, is one we're very familiar with, which I'm going to just go through very briefly here because we know it so well. We've gone through it so many times. It's just this idea of one body, right? We know the whole concept that Paul really lays out in 1 Corinthians 12, that we are one body with many parts, we understand this illustration. It's, it's a beautiful illustration. It's a picture that we, is easily communicated, well understood. I've, I've made mention of it on any, however many occasions. Many diverse parts, one body. You know, within a physical body, there's clear diversity. There's clear distinction. There are clear di differences in function, in purpose, in, in importance, um, in, in the different parts of our body. But in order for my body to function, it has to be in a healthy body. It has to function in unity. My organs need to be operating with my brain and, with, and my eyes have to be paying attention so I don't trip over stuff. And my, you know what I mean? All of it working together in unity. And it's brilliant the way God made us. And uh, in the body, prominence does not directly equate with importance. My nose is prominent. But no one, no one really, people, people may whisper, 
when, 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 I, when, when, when I hit puberty and my nose, my nose hit puberty first. <laughs> it, it said, I'm gonna, let me get a head start. And it jumped ahead of the rest of my face for a while there. And I was like, what are you doing to me? It's like, don't worry, pimples are coming with me. I'm like, sweet, this is great. So people talked about my nose. No one's ever talked to me unless there's a problem about my liver or my pancreas, right? Um, and as much as I wouldn't want to live without my nose, I'm not really interested in that, in that particular uh, existence. I, I could. I could. It's prominent, but I could live without it. Not as well, but I could live without it. My pancreas, my liver, are not prominent. No one sees them. Can't live without them. Got to have them. Right? Need them. So it's a point we've covered many times. The body of Messiah is diverse. Just because you're in a place that's not necessarily prominent doesn't mean you're not critical to the function of what God wants to do in his kingdom through you. Well, no one knows me or knows that. Stop. We together are to function in each of our calling as one in unity. I love how in Philippians, Paul encourages us to operate as one. He says, uh, he says I want to hear, when I hear about you, I want to hear that you're standing firm in one spirit. This is Philippians 1, 27, 28. I want to hear that you're standing firm in one spirit, striving. So there's, a, there's an effort and an energy that's being put forth here. In the hyper-grace movement, the word effort is because there is no effort by which I am saved, right? Not mine. There are my, I do not have the good works for me to be saved. But Paul had said back in Ephesians chapter 2, it's not by works of righteousness that I have been saved, but according to his mercy, the, his grace that he has saved, saved me. But he saved us then in order to do good works. Got, you got it? The good isn't on this side to get me into the kingdom. But once I'm in the kingdom, I am now to reflect the one who is the king of the kingdom, and he is good, and his works are good. And so now I have been saved so I can reflect him and do good works. And we've talked about that before. And there is an effort that is at work in my life. I need to, to put my will in line with God's will. May your will be done. There is the word effort and, 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 and working not to get saved, but once we are saved, to do the work of the king. To do the work that, which he's, called, that he's called us. So he says, don't assume unity is just going to happen. <laughs> don't assume that, well, if we're just not getting along, I guess it just wasn't meant to be. Guess, guess you gotta go, it's uncomfortable for me. Speed bump, speed bump, I'm out. <laughs> he says, quit your whining and make every effort. Make every effort to bring, to walk in unity. Putting up with one another. And here he says, you, well, I want to hear you standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the good news and not being frightened in any way by your opponents. From this, from your unity, they see this as a sign of destruction, but for you, salvation, and that's from God. Striving side by side, one mind, one spirit, your oneness, your unity is evidence that God is at work. But for the last few minutes of our time in the message this morning, I want us to look a little bit more closely at the foundation of unity, of oneness. I want to fast forward to the, the last of all those ones, one God. One God. Shema Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Adonai is echad. First of all, this is especially important to us because as we seek to make the message of Yeshua known to our fellow Jewish people, the, the initial protest against our faith, against the divinity of Yeshua, against the complex unity of God, is based on a misunderstanding of the Shema. Behold, he's, God is one, and you've got three gods, they say. You've got three. Can't be. When we speak of the oneness of God, Adonai, Echad, it is important to understand that Echad does not point to a unique singularity. Yes, in the Hebrew Bible, Echad means one, but it's one as in one day consisting of day and night. In Genesis 1.5, Yom Echad. Or man and woman becoming one, and they shall become one flesh. Levashar Echad. Genesis 1.24. Or all of the pieces of the tag tabernacle together making one unit. Unity. One unit. Echad. All together. One. All of these parts together making one where the presence of God can dwell. Hamishkan Echad in Exodus 36.13. Even the famous Lubavitcher Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who many believed to be the Messiah, he passed away in 1994, um, and then some are waiting for his uh, resurrection. Um, even he noted that the word echad does not pertain to unique singularity. I'm going to read a lengthy quote um, by him, but you can read, with, read along with me so you won't get lost on the way. He writes this, echad means one. The Shema proclaims the oneness and unity of God, which the people of Israel are charged to reveal in the world, and which will, fully be manif will be fully manifest in the era of Moshiach. But is echad the ideal word to express the divine unity? Like its English equivalent, the word does not preclude the existence of other objects, as in the sequence one, two, three, nor does it preclude its object being composed of parts. We speak of one nation, one forest, one person, one tree, despite the fact that each of these consists of many units or components. It would seem that the term yahid, which means singular and only one, more clearly expresses the perfect simplicity of God. I find it interesting, he says, which Maimonides states to be the most fundamental principle of the Jewish faith and the axiom that there is none else besides him. He's like, a better word, it would be if the Lord had decided to use the word yachid. I wish he'd have done that and not caused us this particular confusion. God didn't use the word yachid. He said, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. The Rebbe continues, Hasidic teaching explains that, on the contrary, Echad represents a deeper unity than Yachid. Yachid is a oneness that cannot tolerate plurality. If another being or element is introduced into the equation, the Yachid is no longer Yachid. Echad, on the other hand, represents the fusion of diverse elements into a harmonious whole. I love that. The fusion of diverse elements into a harmonious whole. The oneness of Echad is not undermined by plurality. Indeed, it employs plurality as the ingredients of unity. Unity. Echad speaks of a unity, a complex unity, the different parts making one. Of course, when we were in Ephesians chapter 2, we took an interlude back to Genesis 1. You'll recall when we were, the only good old days were the days in before the fall. And in Genesis 1, the Spirit of God conveys, uh, conveys he, he tells us about the creation of humanity with this particular language. It says, then God said, using the word Elohim, im being a plural word. Elohim is actually a plural word. Uh, there's plurality in the word itself. Then God said, let us make man, Adam, in our image after our likeness. Verse 27, God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The image of God represented in the unity, male and female. We went through this several months ago, so I don't want to belabor at this point. I got to keep moving. But there are those who have tried to assign the language of God here to something equivalent to him using sort of the royal we, where he's like, let us, 
we, we, were, we were thinking, but it's just, so that's, that's the way that's often tried to be, uh, those people have tried to explain that. But God says, and the word for God is plural again, let us make humanity in our image. Later in, you know, Isaiah chapter 6, he says, who will go for us? Who will go for us? And God, he says, let us make man in our image, and then God does so. And in the image of God, he created the male and female, he created them. And we went into greater depth in that message. But what was stunning to me was that in the garden, before sin brought humanity into the condition that we are in, there was such a unity, unity between the husband and the wife that they don't, it doesn't even seem they had different names. We're not even told that Eve had the name Eve until after the fall in Genesis 3.20. And then Genesis 5, 1 and 2 kind of does a brief recap, goes back and says, when God created Adam in the likeness of God, he made him, male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and called their name Adam when he created them. So there was a unity that before sin that is almost impossible for us to imagine. Because there's always, almost always, there's a little bit of competition. There's a little bit of lack of trust. Did they mean what I think they mean? Did they, what, did, what was going on here? Is, are they going to just, if, if I keep doing this, are they going to take advantage of me? I have to look out. I got to look out for me. See, sin seeks after self, to exalt self, to get my way. Satan's rebellion against God was one in which he sought to exalt himself. Before sin entered humanity, there was only a pure unity between the husband and the wife. There was no shame. There was total exposure. It says they were naked and had no shame. There was no fear, no concern. What a, uh, none of that. Only truth. Only trust. Only love. Only joy only peace, no jockeying for position, no battling over who's going to get the credit. My name first, your name first on the, on the, you know, that sign. No battling over that, eating from the tree of life, having everlasting life and therefore not hurrying to get my way. We got all the time in the world. You go first. There'll be plenty of time, plenty of fruit. You first. No sin. There was no brokenness, no need then for redemption, no need for rescuing, total unity. Yes, there was distinction, there's male and female, but they were one, they were echad, in the image of the echad, one, total unity. Throughout the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, we see a complexity to the nature of God in his, in his echad. Over and over, we read of the Ruach HaKodesh, right? His spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God hovering over the face of the deep. The spirit of God from the beginning, right there. There's also throughout the Hebrew scriptures the concept of the word of God in action. It was by the word of God, Psalm 33, 6 says that all things were made. By his word were all things made. Psalm 107, 20 says he sent forth his word and healed them. Isaiah 55 speaks of God's word going forth and accomplishing its mission and then returning to God, having accomplished what his word was sent to do. By the time of Yeshua, the synagogues uh, had been developed. They were developed in exile in Babylon. And the language during the time of Yeshua, which was spoken and read in the synagogues, was Aramaic. Aramaic is basically, it looks just like Hebrew, sounds like Hebrew. It's very much like Hebrew, but there are slight differences. So the Aramaic scrolls, um, they uh, were called the Targums. The Targums. And in these scrolls, in these Targums, when reference was made to God drawing near to man or interacting directly with humanity, very often it is not said that God did this. It would say, it says in the, in the Targums, his memra, his word did this. In the Targum of Genesis 127, it says, the memra, the word of the Lord created man. Over and over, I mean, I, there's a whole list of these. And I'm not going to, I don't have time to belabor the point. There's a recognition of the word of God, the memra of God operating. And so in the Gospels, John op opens his message of good news by conveying this very Jewish Hebraic thought saying, in the beginning was the memra. 
And the Memra was with God. And the Memra was God. He was with God in the beginning. And all things were made through him. And apart from him, nothing was made that has come into being. Verse 14 says, And the Memra, the word, became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we looked upon his glory, the glory of the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. God has been working to redeem us, and he sent his word and healed us. He sent his memra to tabernacle among us. I was once talking with a, a rabbi from uh, here in Sun City, and we were having uh, breakfast together, and he asked me with a level of incredulity, he said, so uh, you expect me to believe that uh, the eternal God of the universe. First of all, that Mary uh, just got pregnant without a man. And then God that expands, fills the universe would now became a baby. You, this is what you want me to believe. I, I, I said, I don't know why this is difficult. I don't understand why this is difficult to believe. I, I, believe, that, I believe that God created the heavens and the earth w- with his word. Like, it came into being because he said it. So if he wants a girl to have a baby without having had sex, I think he could manage that. If he can part the Red Sea, I think he can manage that. So I don't think that's a difficult thing for me. Uh, I said, but I don't understand the problem with God, like, tabernacling among us as a, as a human because it says in Exodus 25, 8, it says the Lord said, make them a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them. That God himself, that his glory dwelt in, in this tent within a tent. Right? And he was, he, did he, did he, was the rest of the universe abandoned of the one who is the source of all life? Was the rest of the universe empty of God? Because he had his glory filled this one location? In Genesis 18, 1, we read you, that Adonai, using the ineffable name of God, yod heh that Adonai appeared to Abraham at Mamre's trees, Lord, the oaks at Mamre, that he appeared to Abraham. He's there. Abraham sees him and says, Boy, your feet look a mess. You must be thirsty. Can I get you some water to wash your feet and so you can also have something to drink? He says, yeah, that'd be a good idea. And he's there with two others, so two angels. The Lord himself was there in Genesis 18. Had he, did his spirit not still fill the universe? Is it all beyond my my, you know, my, my little tiny brain's understanding? Sure. I can't grasp it all. Not, nor, we, we have a limited range of experience with which we are able to compare things. Through the Jewish prophet Isaiah, the Lord declares this in Isaiah 48. The Lord says this, listen to me, Jacob. Israel, whom I called, I am he. I'm the first, I'm also the last. Surely my hand founded the earth. My right hand spread out the heavens. When I call to them, they stand together. They stand as one, he says. Assemble all of you and listen. Who among them foretold these things? Adonai loves him. He will do his will against Babylon. His arm against the Chaldeans. Verse 15, I Even I have spoken. Yes, I called him. I will bring him so his ways will succeed. And then he leans in and says, draw near to me. Hear this. Since the beginning, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it existed, I was there. So now... Adonai Elohim has sent me and his Ruach. I was there in the beginning. I am the first and the last. And now Adonai Elohim has sent me and his Ruach. Shema Yisrael. 
Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. Adonai Elohim. The speaker here, the one who was from the beginning, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the Aleph and the Tav, right? And the Ruach. Not jockeying over position, but functioning as one with purpose, with in a unity that we can't, a wholeness and a unity that we can't fully, we have word pictures that, to grasp, but he is one. The unity that we see in God is the unity that is to be foundational in us. One in purpose, side by side, one in spirit. It's, isn't that what Yeshua prayed for us? In John 17, 21, he prayed for those of us who were not his original followers. He's like, okay, these are my disciples, the ones that will listen to their message and believe, who have not seen all this. I'm praying for them now. So he prays for us. And he prays, he prays that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, and I are in me, and I am in you. So also may they be one in us, so the world may believe you sent me. Our unity declares that the world, that to the world the truth of the gospel. That's why Paul says, by this, when they see you side by side as one, it's a sign to the darkness of its destruction. It's a, it's a sign to the, to, the, the, to the invisible world of darkness that they are perishing, but you have been saved, that you have life, your unity as, you, we, as God performs his unity in us. Until this past September, we were Beth Yechad, house of unity, and now we are Temple Beit Kadash, house of new beginnings. But we're always a house of unity, right? In line with the things of God. Last year when we went through the series on deception that's attacking the believing community from within, you have congregations and ministers and believers who reject things like the belief that Yeshua's death, that his shed blood was necessary for our atonement, that his death is a substitute for my own deserved death. There are congregations that reject that there's a hell. There are congregations that endorse that believers living in ongoing unrepentant sexual sin are just fine, leave them alone. By necessity, we are not in unity with them. Amen. We are not one with them. People say, well, y'all all just need to just, y'all all need to just love one another. We do love them and we pray for them, but we are not in unity with a message that is turning in on itself to undermine the message that brings life and hope. We are not in unity with that. We will, we are in unity with the people of God who are committed to the things of God. Yes, there are little things, different denominations that we, that we disagree over some stuff. Well, let's stop making a big deal about that stuff. And let's f focus on the truth, on the hope that is in God, on the hope that is in Yeshua. We are to be one just as God is one. We are to be a chad, a unit, operating as one man, like an offensive line. We're gonna make an impact when we get to Ephesians 6 and we say, okay, folks, time to put on the armor because we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Put on your armor. Have you ever seen the way Roman battalions operated have you seen in war, old, those movies how they operated as one? Oh, so stinking cool. We will get there, but we have to get the function, the unity that God wants us to have so that we can penetrate the darkness with success, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. It's a complex unity but it's a beautiful unity. Let's stand together this morning. Hallelujah. If this morning, as we prepare to dismiss, if, uh, if you're 
I, you know, we, I asked about visitors earlier. No, no visitors, so everyone's here, has heard the message before. But maybe you're at a place where you know that you're, you're not in unity just because you've not submitted yourself to God. You keep trying to do your own thing, and it's just not working. It may work for a little while where you're like, oh, this is fine. But will you trust the word of the Lord and trust that he knows what's best for you and just submit your life to him and surrender your life to him and watch what he'll do? This morning, if you haven't given your life to Yeshua, call on his name. Surrender to him. If you want one of us to pray with you, there'll be uh, our prayer leaders that'll be up here in the front in just a few moments uh, to pray with you. Let's pray with one another and, uh, and uh, seek his face. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee, but submit yourself to God first. Amen? Amen. God loves you. He loves us. He's brought us out of darkness. He's calling you out of darkness. May the Lord, may the Lord release you and set you free. Throw down. He has broken every chain. Stop hanging on to them. Stop hanging on. Let every chain fall and run to him. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we love you. Teach us what it is to walk in unity, in unity with you, in unity with one another, with the way of the king, Lord, bringing the kingdom of God into the darkness, Lord, transforming by your power that your word would go forth and transform the desolate places that the enemy has has inhabited for generations, that they would be transformed into a place of life, with flourishing beauty and with the river of your water flowing through. Transform the desolate places by the power of your spirit and use us in unity, Lord, to do that. In Yeshua's name.